Grafton Center began as the center of a farming community, but by the early 1800s it had developed as a commercial center for the manufacture of shoes. Before 1800, shoes were made by hand and were custom made for one person at a time. Most shoemakers, called cord wainers, worked in their homes or in small workshops. The shoemaker would measure the foot, cut the pattern from leather, and hire less skilled men to put the shoes together, or farm out some of the sewing tasks to women and girls on neighboring farms. Royal Keith was one of the early manufacturers of shoes in Grafton. He was born in 1769. When his father died, leaving the family in poverty, he was sent to live with his uncle, Elijah Stanton. Stanton lived on Pleasant Street and was an old-fashioned cobbler who made custom shoes for local families. He taught Keith everything he knew. In 1788, when Keith was 19, he went to Boston to work at a custom shoe store near Faneuil Hall. While he was there, the new Revolutionary Congress put a duty on imported shoes and boots to encourage more home manufacturing. Keith saw this as a business opportunity. He returned to Grafton and began manufacturing sail shoes, shoes pre-made in many different sizes. He packed his shoes in flour barrels and sugar boxes and delivered them by horse team to Boston. Within five years, he was able to buy a house and seven acres of land on South Street. As he became more successful, he bought a farm and more land, and by 1827, he owned more than 500 acres, including most of what we now call Keith Hill. He built a very fine mansion on top of the hill and raised a family there. Unfortunately, the mansion was destroyed by fire in 1923. Royal Keith was just one of Grafton's shoe industry entrepreneurs. As the demand for cheap shoes increased, small factories were opened where individual workers would specialize in one task. Many shoe factories, tanneries, currying factories, and shoe-related businesses sprang up, mostly along North and South Streets. The shoe industry increased further with the development of new machines. In 1818, the shoe peg was developed. A small wooden peg was used to hold together multiple layers of leather to make a thick and sturdy sole. This process was done by hand until a pegging machine was invented in 1840, followed by the use of copper nails. By the 1850s, the sewing machine had improved the whole process, and by 1866, there were many Grafton manufacturers making machine-sewn shoes. In addition to tanning and currying, local businesses produced shoes, boots, and other related products. John Whitney and John Slocum had shops on South Street. George Hastings had a little shop where he sold a boot wax of his own invention. Charles Leonard made a blacking that was used by the local boot manufacturers. Shoelaces were made in a factory in North Grafton. On North Street alone, there were more than 10 factories producing shoe-related products. Shoes were made all over town. They were made in the old meeting house after it was moved from the common and converted to commercial use. Even the vestry of the Baptist church was used for shoemaking. Initially, most farmers had a shed devoted to shoemaking, but these gave way as shops and factories evolved. By 1837, Grafton Center led Worcester County in shoe production, leather tanning, and currying. Grafton specialized in coarse brogans, or work boots for the working man and for slaves in Virginia and the Carolinas. That year in Grafton, 906 men and 486 women made over 671,000 pairs of shoes and 18,000 pairs of boots. 
Three large two- and three-story factories were built near Grafton Common. Forbush and Brown Shoe and Boot Manufactory occupied the site of the present library. Gibbs and Allen Manufactures was located at the near end of North Street, and Bigelow and Dodge Leather Currying Company was located a few lots away at 10 North Street. This diorama shows Grafton in 1885 at the height of the shoe industry. It was created by Jean Deschain in 2011. He based his work on an 1885 drawing of the town center. Each structure in the diorama was made by hand, requiring hundreds of hours of painstaking labor. The common and the townhouse can be seen, as well as the three white churches. The Grafton Inn is easily identifiable by its belvedere on its roof. Across Upton Road, on the site of the present-day library, are three buildings. Forbush and Brown Shoe and Boot Manufactory is the largest building. All three buildings were torn down in 1927 to make room for a new library. The Gibbs and Allen Company building stands at the near end of North Street. The factory of Bigelow and Dodge can be seen as the very large building complex three lots farther up on North Street. The Railroad Depot building is located behind the townhouse. In 1885, the railroad tracks ran from North Grafton to this depot and allowed local residents to travel to Worcester for work or Boston for business or pleasure. Only later in 1889 was the Grafton and Upton line extended to Upton and Milford. Another early shoe industry entrepreneur, Captain Jonathan Warren, began making shoes and boots at the age of 20 and continued successfully for 35 years. He was captain of the local militia, town treasurer, state legislator, and founder of the First National Bank. He accumulated much property, and in 1827 he built a Greek revival house on North Street for his family. As his wealth increased, the house was enlarged and the grounds were expanded to include a formal garden, a wagon house, and unique fencing along the front. The property has a view of the Quinsigamond River Valley. In 1850, Jonathan Warren built the Warren Block on Grafton Common, where he manufactured shoes in the basement and leased the rest to other businesses. After it was destroyed by fire in 1862, Warren rebuilt it with a large hall on the second floor to accommodate town meetings and other gatherings. In 1885, the town bought the building for $17,000 and it became the Grafton Town House. It served as the seat of government and the focus of business and social events for the town for over a century. The manufacture of shoes in North Grafton began when James Stone opened a factory in 1848 near the newly established railroad depot. He hired Jasper Nelson, a businessman, who had been manufacturing shoes in Shrewsbury to run his company. Jasper Nelson was born on a 200-acre dairy farm in Shrewsbury. By the age of 23, he was operating a shoemaking business in a one-room building on the farm. His was one of many small shoemaking shops in the area. In 1848, he was hired to take charge of the much larger operation in North Grafton, owned by James Stone. Under Nelson's leadership, the business flourished. Eventually, he bought out his partner and built a four-story factory employing 200 people. He was among the first shoe manufacturers to fully exploit the use of machinery in the production of shoes. In 1878, Jasper built a mansion on an 18-acre estate near the railroad depot and lived there until his death in 1884 at age 62. His son Charles inherited the estate and with his wife Annie expanded the house and made many improvements, including formal gardens. Skilled artisans were hired from Europe to decorate the mansion with carved woodwork, frescoed ceilings, gold leaf stenciled walls, and marble fireplaces decorated with Venetian tiles. It was the finest mansion in town.
Charles lived there and ran the business until his death in 1901. Annie remarried and continued to live in the house with her new husband. Upon her death, the estate was bequeathed to the town of Grafton to be used as a park and library. After the mansion burned down in 1974, a new library was built facing Prentice Strait. The shoe industry in Grafton Center flourished until the 1880s. Then, as it was losing ground to larger, more mechanized manufacturers, Forbush Shoe Company took over the Nelson factory and moved to North Grafton. Charles Nelson had introduced many innovations in manufacturing. In addition to using the newest machines, Charles had begun manufacturing dress shoes, a product uncommon in earlier times. Forbush Shoe Company continued to manufacture dress shoes for men until 1932 when the factory building was sold to the Superior Yeast Company. A fire the following year destroyed the yeast factory. The depot area of North Grafton began to develop into a discreet neighborhood with homes, businesses, and shops when the Boston and Worcester Railroad built a depot there in 1846. At that time, Jotham Taft was operating a small business on Elm Street, making valentines. A controversy exists between Worcester and the town of Grafton regarding the first maker of valentines in the United States. Grafton's claim is that a local man, Jotham Taft, was the originator. Jotham Taft was born in Grafton in 1816 to strict Quaker parents. In 1836, he married Sarah Coe, and twin sons were born two years later. In 1840, Taft was employed by a local businessman to go to Europe to buy stationary supplies. Unfortunately, one of his twin sons died and his young wife was so devastated that he decided to take her with him as a way to cheer her up. During this trip, the Tafts saw lots of valentines on display in Germany and bought materials to make some when they returned home. The valentines were a big hit in Grafton, so in 1844, he opened a small valentine factory in North Grafton. It's thought that Esther Howland, a young woman from Worcester, worked for him and became a valentine maker herself. She's often given credit as the originator of the valentine in America, but we are convinced that the true originator was Taft. He lived to be 93 years old, and his obituary from 1909 reads, Jotham Taft was known throughout the country as the father of the valentine in America. <laughs>